Thanks very much indeed. Well, the, the, the subject today is, is capitalism. Now, capitalism is having a rather odd kind of crisis, which is that everyone seems to agree it's in crisis. Even David Cameron, Conservative Prime Minister, says it's gone wrong and it's in crisis. And yet, despite that, things are continuing exactly under the same sort of model. People are crying out for alternatives. There's lots of discussions about how capitalism can be reformed and so forth, and yet not much in terms of concrete ideas. And this makes for a rather peculiar set of affairs. I mean, I think it's quite clear that people do want something different. The, what people are looking for from the change seems fairly clear. People are not happy with so much of the wealth being concentrated in so few people with certain types of business and corporation banking recently, but who knows what it would be next. Seemingly be able to sort of go about without enough control, without enough social responsibility. And yet here we are, it seems, stuck at the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama put it, um, we're rather like, not this idyllic place we've arrived at, but rather like this picture I've got here. You know, it's not like we're stuck with no way forward, no way back, not really knowing what to do. Now, I wouldn't claim to have a clear vision for you of what the uh, next kind of world should be like. I'm not even sure I can tell us anything about how to get there. Um, what I am planning to say a bit about is how we could think better about how to get there. Now, if that seems rather sort of modest and not very exciting, I think perhaps that's kind of appropriate for someone from a philosophical background to come up with, because uh, philosophy actually hasn't got a very good track record in coming up with more concrete utopias. Anyone who fancies living in Plato's Republic, I think, is probably got a screw loose. So... <laughs> What we need to think about, the, 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 the way of thinking I want to try and get over here is actually to do with, with really what it means to be radical. Because I think that's what we're looking for, some kind of radical difference. We want things to be not just a little bit different, but very different. And I think the problem is that perhaps we make certain assumptions about what radical change requires. In particular, it's the idea that you know to achieve massive change, you need to make massive changes. The whole structures have to be changed and so forth. Actually... I don't think that's true. I think that a lot of the time you could achieve major transformations by just making the right changes. And they needn't be huge systemic ones, things which overturn the whole order. Now, how is that possible? Well, there are various ways in which we can see that as being possible. I mean, just, just think of how much scope there is to think differently within the same basic paradigm. One way is that from exactly the same premises, accepting the same facts, people can come to radically different conclusions about what can be done and what should be done. And climate change, I think, is a good example of that. We tend to think the most important debate is between people who deny it's happening and those who accept it's happening. In fact, you know, the deniers are very powerful and vocal, but they are a small minority. But actually, there's a huge range of opinion and probably the most important debates we're going to have to have are amongst those who accept fully that there is such a thing as anthropogenic uh, climate change. But what do we do about it? Do we try and basically cut down our emissions to try and stop it or reverse it? Do we accept that it's going to happen and do what you know Lomborg suggests and try and basically use economic growth to make us able to adapt and cope with the changes that are going to come and we can't stop? Do we go for technological fixes? Do we go for some combination of them? I mean, all these are quite big disagreements, which would, if we followed one route or the other, would be very, very different in what we did. And yet they're all accepting the same basic paradigm. It's not that people need a radically different way of thinking about what the problem is and what the facts on the ground are. In the same kind of way, um, if people think about values, I mean, within certain systems, within the same system, people can achieve very different results simply by having different values. Now, the point about this picture is that there is an airline, which is actually not the one illustrated by this, so if you can identify an airline by its seat livery, what I'm saying is not libelous, we know there are certain airlines which do make people want to put their heads in their hands in despair because they are really just very aggressively about maximising profit and so forth. And this is kind of the image we have of a lot of business and corporations. But there are also businesses in exactly the same system, exactly the same regulatory framework, exactly the same capitalist model, operate very differently. And I'm thinking in particular of a high street chain of uh, shoe repairers and key repairers. I don't know if you know about the company I'm talking about, but 
they're actually tremendously uh, th socially responsible. They do a lot of work. They employ lots of ex-offenders. They probably do more for the successful rehabilitation of former inmates than a lot of state agencies. So there's always that capacity, if you have the right values, to achieve very different results in exactly the same framework. And I suppose the overriding point here, and the, the key one which links the two things I've already said, is that we should recognise the fact that sometimes just piecemeal change can lead to wholesale transformation. You don't need to completely rip up everything and start from scratch. If you make the right small individual changes, then you can bring about an enormous transformation. And for good or for bad, for that matter, it's not all good, um, and I'm, let's say at the very least an ambivalent example of this are the changes the Thatcher government brought in in the early 80s around trade unions. Just by passing a couple of laws which changed quite specific rules about ballots and what was required in order for a strike to be lawful, there was a massive change in industrial relations in the country and a massive shift of power away from the unions. Some people thought that was great, some people thought it was an absolute disaster. But you can see that's actually a really big change. If you sort of like pick up a newspaper from a random day in the 70s and then 20 years later, you can see what a huge difference it made to industrial relations. Just one piece of legislation. No one, you know, rewrote what the rule book of democracy. Um, more significantly, of course, enfranchisement. I mean, there was a time where simply by extending the franchise to an, a part of the population who previously hadn't given the vote opened up huge opportunities for a much more equal society in the progression of, of women's rights. So we, we, we can see how sometimes what brings about uh, a real significant transformation of society is simply a, a small piecemeal change. And that's the kind of key idea that I want to think about. It's, it's about trying to sort of like think more in those terms. And the, the term I sort of use comes from thinking of these things as radical ad hoc measures. You know, radicalism isn't about necessarily say, overhauling a system. It's about making those individual small interventions which nonetheless can have huge transformational results. Radical and ad hoc um, compresses rather neatly to rad hoc. So let's use this term um, rad hoc to talk about what we're going to think about. Now, so let's think about capitalism then. So where is the scope for rad hoc reform of capitalism? Well, first of all, if you're going to get going on this, you have to get beyond, I think, the rather stale stereotype. When people talk about capitalism, they often criticise it in pure caricature. They say it's purely about the profit motive, there are no other values going along, it's the unfettered free market. Well, maybe in principle, there are certain forms of capitalism which are like that, but that is just isn't really existent capitalism. And what we're trying to reform, after all, is not some free market ideal of capitalism, but really existent capitalism. And that, I think, has three key components, all of which provide opportunity for rad hoc reform. The first aspect of really existent capitalism is that we have regulated markets, and the regulated term is, of course, very important. We also have mixed economies. We have a mix of state ownership and private ownership, and within private ownership, lots of different types of private ownership. And, of course, all that is underpinned by a democratic system. Now, if you look at those uh, things, I think there's, there's, you can see how all those things offer quite a lot of opportunity for change. The overall structure remains the same. The, the, the structures of actually existent Western capitalism can be kept with these three elements. But what we do within those confines could be radically transformational. And actually, the thing I like most about this idea, in a way, is that the justification for it comes directly from the most orthodox free market economic theory you can imagine. Because in orthodox free market economics, there is a concept of the externality. Now, an externality is a byproduct of economic activity. Now, a positive externality is a good one. So it's one that people can benefit from even though they themselves have not contributed to it. So for example, let's say there's a, a, a site in the town centre which is you know, a mess, it's derelict. Someone comes along and they build a nice new office block there. Now, as a person who lives there, you benefit from that because there, there is a benefit to having a more pleasant environment, but you don't pay for it, you don't use it. That's a nice positive externality. Uh, my favourite positive externality is simply the smell of fresh coffee coming from a, a wonderful shop on St Michael's Hill when you walk past there. But of course negative externalities are more problematic, pollution being the main one. If you are engaged in a form of economic activity and you produce pollution, if you don't have to pay for that in some way, then you're basically offloading your costs onto other people. Other people have to pay the price of your pollution. Now, 
Orthodox free market economic theory accepts the fact that it is perfectly legitimate to do something about that. Now, the most orthodox people would say the way you deal with that is you price the externality. The, 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 the cost of the externality is really what people would be prepared to pay to eliminate it or to be compensated for it or whatever it might be. Uh, and it's as simple as that. But actually, I think you have to be a, a quite extreme to think that's the only way to deal with an externality. In the real world, in real existing capitalism, what we do is we use other tools. We, we ban things or we regulate them or we do various things to mitigate them. We don't just rely on economic levers. We bring in legislation. So, for example, it is simply illegal to pollute. We don't say you can pollute however much you like just as long as you pay for the costs of cleaning it up afterwards. That, you know, if someone who thought that way would be a typical example of Oscar Wilde's person who you know, knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. So we know that the way we deal with negative externalities can be regulation, rules, limiting, stopping them happening. Um, the other, and, and there are all sorts of things, I mean, you know, so there are all sorts of things that are, I think, negative externalities, which we recognise. I think that's, it, it, the term is un, unusual, but that's exactly what I think what people are getting agitated about, about capitalism at the moment. They're noticing that economic activity is having negative side effects which as a society we're picking up the cost of and these include things like greater inequality exclusion of people from the mainstream um, uglification of, of high streets uh, advertising aspirational things like that and I think there's a scope to do things with that um, the mixed economy is the other element I mean people think about capitalism fatalistically is about just being private business going its whole way but again actually existing capitalism isn't like that we all have mixed economies and in all these capitalist countries, it varies enormously, actually, what that kind of spread is. So in Norway, for example, the government owns 30% of the stock on the Oslo Stock Exchange. And if you take into account non-listed companies, it owns a greater proportion of the Norwegian economy. So you get things like nice um, state-owned trains like this. This is a Norwegian train. It's not exactly first great western for anyone who's used to taking that line <laughs> up, up to London. Uh, and nevertheless, it's also ranked number eight for the most sort of competitive, best place to do business in the world by the a World Bank rating. So it's not that this high degree of state ownership makes the economy uncompetitive. Far from it, because it's not about state control. It's not about state sort of, you know, control of the and uh, central state planning in the old Soviet system. It's simply about ownership and the businesses themselves are allowed to run themselves quasi-autonomously. And of course there are other kind of models as well. So we, we've got an, a whole area there around who owns businesses, how they're owned, which if we think about that gives us scope to, to, to make changes. And the final thing is democracy itself, which <laughs> time constraints means I can't really go into too much. But you know, why do we kind of think the most radical thing we can do in terms of democratic reform is choose between first past the post or a slightly more proportional system? I think we might have other ideas which I'll, which I'll come to. Now, all of this might sound all well and good so far, but you might say this is just all sort of like promise and, and, and no delivery. And unless we have concrete ideas about what sort of rad hoc changes we can make, then this is just an empty idea. Now, on the one hand, I would say, that's kind of fine. I did say at the beginning that, in a way, all I'm trying to do is to encourage us to think along certain lines. And it's for other people who know more about specific sectors and areas to actually come up with those ideas, but also to sell them, you know, to, to get used to the idea that we can take individual piecemeal pieces of bits of reform and nevertheless achieve great results. But it would be a bit of a cop out not to say anything at all about specific things we could do. And I think, but actually, one of the most inspiring things about this is actually we can see that in the past there have been ones as well. Here's a trio of, of legislation in the late 40s, the Education Act 1944, National Health Service Act 1946, and the National Insurance Act of 1948. These three things introduced universal free education, universal free health care, maternity benefits, unemployment benefits, retirement benefits. I mean, you, you kind of imagine before 1944 these things didn't exist. By 1948 they all existed. And we kind of take those changes for granted. They were utterly transformational, but they're quintessentially rad hoc in the way I use the term. None of them required a fundamental change to our democratic system, the, the, the form of our economy and so forth. They simply took imagination and political will and the desire of the people to sort of achieve certain values. So I think if we look back at that, it's been a long time since we've done anything so transformational. But I think this is a wonderful example from 
history which shows that you know we shouldn't be pessimistic about how much the right kind of reform can really bring change but in terms of some ideas, I'll just throw out some ideas. They might be rubbish, they might not, and we'll see what you think. Um, but to give an idea of the kind of ways we could be thinking. In terms of democracy, I think there are all sorts of things. I, I would really like, I think the reform of the House of Lords is going to be a terrible wasted opportunity because it's just going to be more party members with party whips and a replica of the main chamber. Why not an Athenian type system where you select people at random by ballot? There are people seriously suggesting this to serve, say, five years in the upper chamber. So a kind of citizen's jury scrutinising the main chamber. And there's a lot of evidence that this is not nonsense at all, that when you inform ordinary citizens about things, they make very good, sensible and wise decisions. I don't see why we couldn't do that. It would retain the fundamentals of our system, which is that it is democratic, but utterly change just one aspect of its workings, and then I think that could have a really big change in challenging the way in which uh, the party system in particular is very constraining. And even if we don't go that far, I think we should ban whipping. I think that once elected to Parliament, an MP should be free from any uh, coercion and constraint from any organisation they belong to, give genuine independence to members of Parliament, and you could already sort of change things democratically there. When it comes to um, ownership, I think there's a lot of possibilities here. And it is rather interesting at the moment, everyone seems to be very interested in the possibility of expanding mutuals and co-ops. And quite rightly, you know, the John Lewis partnership is held up as a model. And you know, last year it gave away almost £200 million back to its members, its employees, the people who work for it. Now that's money which otherwise would have gone into the pockets of investors and, and stockholders and so forth. It's going straight back to people. Now, there are things you could do which would probably be quite limited in some ways. It's about setting up the right kind of tax incentives, the right kind of legal incentives to make co-ops and mutuals much easier. And if you did that, there could be a, a really major shift in the economy as time goes by towards more of this kind of business. And that could have, I think, a very big and important change. It, it, it wouldn't actually be difficult, and it's being seriously considered by major parties. There's also more scope for state ownership as well. I've got this picture here because I'm thinking of the BBC. BBC is a very good sort of model of how a state-owned enterprise can be. It's not state-run, that's the key thing. State-owned, not state-run. It's independent and it's kind of a beacon of excellence. It itself has to compete with um, private sector which keeps its own standards up but also because it has an ethos which is not just about profit it helps to elevate the standards elsewhere so in a sense I don't see why we couldn't be a bit more Norwegian perhaps we should have a state-owned company in every sector one whose motivation is it's competing out there in the market alongside everything else on the same terms but it has a clear public benefit ethos which will then transform the nature of businesses around it and in terms of externalities, I think this is the, the real thing where there's a lot of scope. If we just accept the fact and are clearer that there are some things which are side effects of economic activity which we're not prepared to put up with, we have the justification mm -hmm. and we have the tools often to... Mm -hmm. Oh, the time is done there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that suddenly turned me to shut up. Actually, it started before I started, so I actually have got a minute or two left. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I mean, inequality, for example, is, you know, it's a problem, isn't it? I mean, and, and it's an, it's, it, there's no reason why we should put up with it. We have minimum wage. Why not have a, 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 a living wage? This is being proposed. There's already one in London. When the minimum wage came in in this country, people prophesied it would lead to loss of jobs and everything. It did no such thing. If we can have a minimum wage with political will, we could have a, a, a living wage. I think how that would change things. Think how it would really change society if everyone in a job could genuinely afford to have a decent standard of living. And it doesn't require change the whole system, as I go on about. I better, I better wrap up. I mean, I have to say that you may not believe it, given the way I've been talking. I'm actually a bit of a cynic on the whole. I, when people start talking about the possibility of a better world and transformation, I think, yeah, yeah, it's the dawning of the age of Aquarius again. It, it ain't going to happen. But what I really like about the idea of rad hoc change is that it actually accepts the fact that, that there is going to be no change or there need be no change to the overall system. And for me, the really reactionary thought at the moment is to think that we're stuck either with the status quo and, and business as usual and no possibility of change, and that the only way to, to overturn that would be some as yet unimagined and perhaps impossible, completely different system. 
I think the truly radical thought is to say that within the confines of the system we currently have, we have much, much more scope to make radical ad hoc changes and bring about transformation than we think. And if we start thinking in that way, I think that it's almost limitless the number of ideas that we might have. And some of them, even if none of the ones I've suggested today, actually might have a chance of, of flying and achieving something. Thanks very much.